Howdy, everybody. So we're picking up with kind of a topical lecture this time. So we're taking a break from the chronological and doing a few kind of a two part topical one. We'll talk about first the new women's movement movement in the 19 late 60s, early 1970s. And then we'll switch over and do like another little mini version of space race kind of going back to Kennedy and Eisenhower and then pulling it all the way up until we land on the moon. So women's rights has been active you know 1848 with the Seneca Falls Commission we've been talking about that for you know 100 years in our class and women have been involved in the civil rights movement as well and the experiences that kind of helped them support the civil rights movement was going to galvanize them to ask for civil rights for themselves not just for blacks or Mexican Americans or any of the other groups but also for women as a group unto itself and so was born the second big wave of women's rights activism. So you had the first big push, which was mainly for the right to vote, which they got in 1920. Now they're gonna want more fair treatment across society in general. So this is gonna be a time of a lot of change. So women did not have equal rights in all sorts of things, from not being allowed to have a credit card in your own name, had to be in your husband's, to education. Women were banned from most Texas universities. Many things that we just take for granted to today. Say a woman's having a C-section when she's giving birth. 50, 60, 70 years ago, she would need the husband's signature before she could have her C-section, before she could have any kind of surgery. This is the weirdness of the times. Now, companies were openly saying they would pay women less. They would pay a man more, arguing that a man had to support his family and the women were just working because they wanted some pocket money. Even though many of these women were actually working because they needed the money to support their family as well. And indeed, women made up about 40% less than what men doing the same job. 40% during the 1960s and 70s. So women are fighting for their rights to vote, but you can see in kind of these ads in the 1960s and 1970s kind of how women were portrayed. So you can kind of see in this Van Heusen one, she's serving on her knees the man breakfast. So harder the wife, so the harder the wife works, the cuter she looks, kind of pushing women into this household kind of role. The chef does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. Sooner or later, your wife will drive home one of the best reasons for owning a Volkswagen, implying the stereotype that women are bad drivers, so you better buy them a safe car for your wife and kids. Keep her where she belongs. Now, I'm not sure what this is implying or even trying to sell. Maybe a shoe, but why is she naked? Why is she laying on the floor next to a shoe? Who knows? But you can kind of get the idea, the gist of what's going to happen. Now, if you ever watch the show Mad Men, this is a big ad agency set in this time period where women are just coming on to the workforce. And I've added a couple clips on Blackboard that I highly recommend watching, kind of showing the sexism that's happening in the workplace. At times it reaches even full on sexual assault, but it's seen as normal, particularly for men to behave in this way. So this is a fundamental problem with society. But not everyone agrees with this issue. Some people want it to change and are willing to push back. And in 1963, Betty Friedan published a book called The Feminine Mystique, in which she argued that women face, quote, the problem that has no name, which was she argued that many women were miserable in the prescribed gender roles and they wanted to do something else. They didn't necessarily just want to be housewives. Now, some women liked being housewives, and that's perfectly fine for them but others were unfulfilled, unsatisfied. And she was arguing whether women want a different role in life, whether they want a job or want to do something else other than being a mother or a housewife was irrelevant. Women needed the option to be able to pick. Like they can pick to be a housewife and that's fine, but they needed the option to pick. And that's where we have the real problem. She's arguing that as women, they did not have the choices they felt they should. Now, women have been involved in the civil rights movement for a very long time. And you have people like Rosa Parks and major figures we've talked about, but 
more often than not, women are pushed to the peripheral as supporters for the men in the civil rights movement, you know, organizing kind of the meetings and providing sandwiches and all these kinds of things which kind of marginalize and peripheralize women's contribution, even though without these women and their organizational skills at times in some of these civil rights organizations, it would simply not have happened. Women were an important role. They made up half of these civil rights movements. Now to show you some of the sexism that's still prevalent during this time period, you'll remember SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This is its leader. These are the guys that did the sit-ins and the lunch counters. So this is Stokely Carmichael, the leader of SNCC, SNCC. Now one question, what was women's role in civil rights? This is what he had to say. The only position for women in SNCC is prone, meaning on her back as a sexual object, not anything else. So this is a fundamental problem. Now what's going to begin changing everything and give women, women more legal rights is going to be uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that LBJ got passed just after JFK's assassination. Now, this was targeted at African Americans, particularly minorities, providing them with more civil rights. But this guy, Congressman Howard Smith of Virginia, was trying to kill the bill. So he added something to the law that he thought no man in Congress would vote for. He added the word sex, meaning that it was you couldn't discriminate based on sex. He thought, oh, well, if we give women rights, no one will vote for this, and then they'll keep minorities from getting their rights. But the actual opposite happened. People went ahead and passed it, and he accidentally ended up giving women more rights as well as minority groups. So his bigoted, sexist nature actually counteracted what he wanted to do, and now you have laws protecting women's rights. And it's gonna be in this context, in the fall of 1966, that a band of activists, including Betty Friedan, uh, formally created and founded the National Organization for Women and patterned it after the NAACP, so a legal strategy. Now, Never Radical now pursued its two major policy goals. One, the passage of an equal rights amendment, and two, sexual equality in the workplace. Now, it attempted to accomplish these things through normal political channels. It also made clear that it was the national organization for women, not of women, because they wanted men to be involved in this narrative and story as well. So the NAACP had done the same in their founding in 1909. And this had proved crucial for their kind of long-term success in getting broad support from any of their programs by being as inclusive, multiple races, multiple genders, all these types of things. This is where the real power was. Now, the organization, the National Organization for Women, did find most of its support mainly from white middle-class women, typically the people that had reacted to Betty Friedan's book as well. And you have this growing coalition of these women that began to fight. And by the early 1970s, the organization was starting to have some powerful results. So you have Gloria Steinman. In 1972, she and other feminists founded a journalist or a journal called Miss Magazine. And this is the first consumer magazine focused at feminists. So it's like Betty Friedan's uh, Feminine Mystique, but in a monthly installment. Then you have the push for the Equal Rights Amendment, and this is big. So it was first proposed in 1923. The amendment quite simply said, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. So pretty straightforward, pretty clear. Had been proposed pretty early, but it's just now going to a vote. Now the purpose was to prevent discrimination based on gender. And it passed the US Congress in 1971 and began to be approved by various states. And to our credit, Texas approved it in 1972 along with 33 other states. However, by the mid 1970s, it remained three states short of winning passage, and ultimately it will die. But there's other aspects, so you can kind of see which states voted for and which states did not. You can see that Deep South 
not very progressive on women's rights, just like they're not very progressive on a lot of other issues. So if we're picking up with women's rights, they did not get the Equal Rights Amendment, but they do get something else added. They get something called Title IX. So in 1972, there's another major victory with the passage of Title IX. It's an amendment to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which included educational institutions. Now, what that meant is that women could no longer be excluded from colleges or universities, uh, which at that point they were in many places across the nation. This opened up higher education in a new way to many women. Now, Title IX is most often kind of referred to today as in like sports, but this is the true heart of it. So trying to have, if you have a male sport, you have to have the female sport. That's how it's used today, most often. And you also get some Title IX for protection, uh, so sexual assault protection, things like that today as well. Now it's gonna be at this time that A&M is forced to admit women. So women had been allowed to go to A&M, but they couldn't live on campus. And now A&M is opening its doors to being able to live in dorms on campus as well. My mother was the first year of women able to live on campus as well as go to A&M. So that's one generation. My mother was the first generation to go do this. This is not that long ago that women were given rights to enter college. So keep that in mind. Some of these things seem foreign and long off and far away, but they weren't that long ago. So we gotta understand things have changed pretty rapidly up until today. Now there's several other advances for women in Texas. In 1972, women got a state constitutional amendment passed that prohibited discrimination against women. And in 1977, the Women's National Conference was held in Houston. It was the first national conference of its kind since Seneca Falls in 1848. So while Texas is extra conservative in some ways, I mean, discriminatory in some, in women's rights, we seem to be fairly amenable to it. Now, another major case coming from Texas is Roe v. Wade in 1973. This deals with abortion. So this is one of the more controversial cases that came out of Texas and hit national headlines in 1973. It involved a legal suit in Dallas starting in 1970. The plaintiff was a pregnant woman referred to as Jane Roe to protect her identity. And she filed suit against the Dallas District Attorney, Henry Wade. Now, the argument of Roe was that Texas state laws against abortion were unconstitutional, and the lower courts, and lower courts in Texas agreed with her. Henry Wade, however, refused to stop prosecuting doctors in Dallas who performed abortions, and the case made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1973, the court ruled in favor of Roe and said such anti-abortion laws were unconstitutional. But the problem was, it left murky the question of restrictions based on the length of pregnancy. So generally in the United States, we have accepted abortion as a legal option. But when that abortion can take place, how many weeks, how many months into a pregnancy can that abortion still occur? That is the heart of the debate today. So women are making significant progress with their civil rights and the United States is rapidly progressing in science and technology also at the same time. Now we'll talk more about women's rights as we go through the last little bit of the class, but we're gonna switch over and talk about the space race for a little bit. So in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the space race is going to define it. As women are fighting for their rights, science and technology are racing in the heart of the Cold War to the moon. So if you all remember, when we talked about the first big push towards space, Eisenhower had to reluctantly create NASA when we got, or when the Russians placed Sputnik in the skies. And we felt like we were falling behind because of Sputnik. So the Soviets launched Sputnik first, and they also put the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, in 1961. And we tried hard to catch up. Alan Shepard became the first American in space just shortly after in 1961 as well, but he kind of briefly went up. Then Kennedy is going to give a speech. He believed the space race was the key component of Cold War policy. It was as much as anything a PR move between the USSR and the United States and us. 
we are trying to say we are better because of our technological superiority. If we could get places first, do the best, we were winning. If not, the opposite would be true. And there's also clear military implications. If we can control satellites and control space, we can put missiles and other targeting systems up on these satellites to maybe target our enemies. So this is important. Also can help us defend against enemy attacks. So Kennedy announced something absolutely astonishing. In 1961, we were planning to go to the moon and get there by the end of the decade. So this is when we start beginning the Apollo program. So in 1962, John Glenn becomes the first man to orbit the Earth. As the first American to orbit, he was given a ticker tape parade, so he was celebrated. Around the world, people celebrated, but especially in the United States. And efforts continued to rush forward. By 1967, the new Apollo program was in full swing. In testing a new spacecraft for launch, three Americans died when the Apollo 1 spacecraft caught fire during a test launch on the launch pad. In December of 1968, the Apollo 8 program took off and its crew rode the Saturn V rocket into space and then did what no astronaut had ever done before. They left the Earth's orbit. So this is astonishing. Just think about it. Earth, you have gravity floating around it. That's what holds you here. When you break away, once you leave Earth's gravitational pull, there's nothing stopping you unless you interact with another planetary body. So just imagine, once you get out there, you better have a way to get back, otherwise you're screwed. So this Apollo 8 crew is going to leave Earth and they're going to enter lunar orbit. They leave, America, or leave uh, Earth's orbit and go to lunar orbit. Now what they're basically doing, you kind of see in this diagram, they go around Earth once or twice and they're gonna use the momentum building from going around Earth to slingshot themselves. They'll fire the rockets at just the right moment to slingshot themselves at the moon, then swing around the moon a few times and slingshot themselves back to Earth. Now think about this. The moon rotates around the Earth and the Earth's constantly moving around the sun. That means as they're slingshotting themselves across, you know, thousands of miles, they're having to hit the moon at a certain moment because if they miss, they just keep going and don't have enough fuel or the ability to come back of their own power. So this is crazy. Now, all of this is going to come to a head in the summer of 1969 on whether or not we can land on the moon. Now, Kennedy's great speech said we would have a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Well, it's 69, that decade's coming rapidly to an end and we need a man on the moon. So. On July 16th, 1969, the Columbia took off from Cape Kennedy in Florida for a 286,000 mile journey to the moon. Aboard were Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins. And they made the two and a half, or they made two and a half orbits around the Earth and used that to fling themselves at the moon. It was gonna be a three day journey to get to the moon. As they neared the moon, Neil and Buzz boarded a moon craft called the Eagle. And on July 20th, 1969, they touched down uh, a small moon craft. They touched down on the moon before a televised audience of 723 million people. That's one fifth of the Earth's population and stopped what they were doing to watch this. Now keep in mind, this is Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin that got to ride the Eagle down to the moon. Mike Collins had to stay in the Apollo craft to catch them on their way up. So think about that, you make it all the way to the moon and you have to watch your two buddies go do it while you have to just sit in orbit. So it's kind of bittersweet. Now Armstrong and Aldrin spent only about two hours and 15 minutes walking on the moon as a television camera beamed back pictures to the earth of the men bouncing around, gathering rock samples and planting a small American flag. Now, I posted a link to a big documentary on this that I highly recommend. And then I've also posted the live footage that was streamed or sent via, uh, uh, through the TVs to people around the world. So I recommend watching both of those, especially the live 
video. Now, this is a real triumph for humanity. We've left our planetary body and gone to another. This is something people have dreamed about since they could see the moon. So this is truly earth shattering. Now it's a major PR move for the United States during the Cold War, but I also wanna point out the remarkable speed at which we achieved this. So think about it. It was only in 1903 that the Wright brothers proved that men could fly. So, 1903, 1969, 33 years later, we put a man on the moon. That is rapid technological growth. We go from flying being a dream to being able to fly to having so much aeronautical knowledge that we can make it to the moon. So this is world changing. And Americans needed something to celebrate because as we entered the 1970s, there's not a lot to celebrate. There was a lot of tension, a lot of anger, and a lot of problems going on, particularly when we get to the election of Jimmy Carter. So we talked a little about OPEC and the crisis there, the gas shortage, uh, Texas kind of weathered it. But it's going to be with the rise of Jimmy Carter. Now, it's not Carter's fault that things go bad but he's just gonna have the unfortunate honor of being the president during the time when a big chunk of American society begins to collapse and international politics doesn't go as well as he would hope. We'll stop there for today and we'll pick up with Jimmy Carter next lecture.